My name is Janet Beale. I'm the, I was Bookchin's um, companion and collaborator for the last 19 years of his life. Um, um, and I wrote his biography, Ecology or Catastrophe, that may, some of you may have, may have read and edited and compiled and wrote other articles on, on, on Bookchin's work during that, during that time. And oh, including the politics of libertarian municipalism, which we intended to be just a, a, a summary of his ideas as an alternative to the book Urbanization, which was very long and complex. We needed a little handbook, a little primer for people um, who wanted to start thinking along these terms and organizing along these lines. And so that's why we put together the politics of social ecology. Um, I have to be honest with you, I have to say, I no longer consider myself a proponent of, of social ecology. I have a great deal of respect for Murray's ideas. I have no regrets about the time I spent with him, but I no longer consider myself a social ecologist. I have, but because I was privileged to spend so much time with him and work with him, I feel a great responsibility to ensuring that his ideas are conveyed accurately to the future, that's one reason I wrote the biography was because I wanted to be sure that people understood what his ideas were uh, as accurately as possible. And of course, I have a great fascination and interest in what happens to his ideas and his work um, in, the next, in, the next, in the next chunk of time. Um, in other words, with his legacy. So that's why I wanted, was eager to participate in the book and to um, participate in this, in this um, panel. Teo and Alexandros, thank you very much for explaining about the legacy of Bookchin in France and in Greece. I learned a lot from both of you. Eve, thank you for the living commons. I think Murray would have been fascinated to observe this exper experiment in collective design. Um, I really, was really happy to hear you talking about how everything is under the purview of the assembly, about the importance of citizenship, subsuming other identities, um, about the moral economy. Thank you for that. Um, Lou, Murray would have agreed that economics is not the king of sciences. Um, and he too was eager to put, the, to shift the focus away from that. Um, Nikos, nothing, nothing could have pleased him more than to hear about strengthening community. And Jason, I agreed that there are affinities between Murray's ideas and Hannah Arendt's. Um, I have to say that the, the books that were on our bookshelf that were most read and most thumbed through were On Revolution and The Human Condition. Um, I don't know if that's useful to you to know that or not, but it sounds like you're, you're on the right track anyway. Um, and yes, certainly would have agreed that lasting revolutionary change does not come from violence. So, so this, this um, my contribution, apart from the cover, my contribution to this, to Yavor's anthology is actually a paper that I wrote in early 2012 um, about Murray Bookchin and Abdullah Erjalan. I had been invited to give a speech at a conference on Erjalan's ideas in Hamburg, Germany that April, in April of 2002. And by that time I knew very well that Murray's ideas and writings had influenced Abdullah Erjalan um, in Turkish translation. Um, especially when it comes to came to themes of democracy, hierarchy, and ecology. I knew that in kind of a general way, and I knew that there was that, and I, I came very quickly to understand that the Kurdish movement, when they when they adopt an idea, they try to implement it. They don't just put it on a shelf and admire it. They try to implement it. So that once once I got once I understood that, it gave a great urgency to the to the problem project of trying to understand just what are the, on a, on a, on a more detailed level, what, what, what were the influences? And so I looked at, I, at, at the time I was in the immersed, immersed in writing Ecology or Catastrophe, the, writing, the biography of Murray, but I was less familiar with Urgelan's ideas and not many of his works had been translated into English at that time, but based on what was available, I went through what I went through to look at to try to get a sense of it intellectually, places where the ideas overlapped and diverged. And also I couldn't help but notice their sort of parallel life trajectories of going from Marxists to, or actually Marxist-Leninists to, um, to democratic ecologists, social ecologists. 
to be honest, I wrote that because I was trying to figure it out for myself. <laughs> but, um, and it was of course clear that opposition to the na nation state is a very important idea for both of them. Um, I think that was a, 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 a very important to why Erdogan was interested in Murray's ideas because the Kurdish movement saw the state as an instrument of repression. It was the only experience, literally the only experience they'd had with it. All, it, all it, the states of the Middle East had done was persecute them. And um, it was quite clear to see why the idea of bottom up democratic self-government through citizen assemblies would be very appealing to them. So much more of Erchelan's work has been translated into English by now. And I know that I know of some scholars who are at work on doing a more granular side-by-side -side evaluation um, than I was able to do back then and than I could do back then. Um, especially scholar, important scholars who can read Erdogan in Turkish as well as English. So uh, I look forward to, I look forward to, to that 2012 article. I think it already probably has been superseded and I look forward to um, others, others, these other scholars building on it in the future. So, but back when I wrote that article in April, 2012, it was all still kind of abstract, at, at least to me. Um, um, I, I, I did understand that Kurds had taken their commitment to democratic confederalism very seriously since the since Erdogan's declaration of democratic confederalism in 2006, Nuraj, 2006. Um, in southeastern Turkey, they had declared democratic autonomy in 2009. And um, I would go on to translate a book from German called Democratic Autonomy in North Kurdistan, which is southeastern Turkey because I wanted to know more about those institutions. But um, in Southeastern Turkey, I have to say they, it was very difficult for Kurds to build grassroots democratic institutions because they were perpetually repressed. Almost as soon as the institutions were set up, they were crushed. And if you've seen that book, Democratic Autonomy in North Kurd Kurdistan that I translated, there are very few names of individuals and very few pictures of people because obviously they're hiding, you know, they. They're subjected to such persecution. They couldn't they'd be locked up in jail if their pictures were published. So there's a lot at stake. But I gave that lecture in 2000, April of 2012. And then unbeknownst to me in July, just a, it was just a few much, months later that the revolution in Rojava began. Um, the summer, in that summer, the uh, city of Kobani, Kobani was liberated first and then Afrin, a day later, and the rest of the cities in northern and northeastern Syria declared democratic autonomy, democratic confederalism, just as because uh, um, Assad, the dictator, had to redeploy troops from there to fight the insurgency in the south. And um, it was, I have to say, they, <laughs> the Kurds, they seized their moment, didn't they? Um, and, but it was only gradually that I became aware that the Kurdish led areas were forming a new polity based on democratic confederalism, democratic autonomy. And clearly because they took to it so quickly, it was clear that they had been organizing along these lines for years since 2007 in some parts of Syria when such organizing was terribly illegal and they, took, they were risking their lives. And yet they continued to organize anyway and began to create alternative institutions under Tevdem and especially the women who did a lot of the early organizing because somehow the, the dictators couldn't believe that women would actually be politically active and so they were less suspicious and they were able to do a lot of it. So that by the time the big night came in Kobani in July, 2012, the revolutionary movement was ready for for when the, the brass ring came around, for when they're, they're, the, rev, the big night came. Uh, as I, I think, um, Theo, that's what they call it in France, right? The big night the, the <laughs> of, of epical change. Um, and, and soon, um, as I said, the other cities in the, in the area uh, blossomed into uh, self-government. Um, I made three trips to Rojava to see for myself between 2014 and 2019. It's very privileged to be invited on several delegations to do that. And I, I decided in, in preparing for this talk, I should look at some of the ways that 
the experience in northeastern Syria has advanced Murray's ideas because they they worked from them. I, but I have to say, without reading them initially, Murray hasn't been translated. Books Murray's works haven't been translated into Arabic or into Kurdish so much. And when I was there in 2019, I was sort of asking people about Bookchin and the, the people who had heard of him were the ones, they said, well, we know about him because Ojalan mentioned him. Not, be, not from direct interaction with his works it's because the translation has been a little slow. And so I hope, I'm just always uh, hoping that there will be more translations um, so that people in Northeastern Syria can read them for, for themselves. But in any case, whether even without <laughs> reading them, they advanced his ideas um, in several ways. First of all, they actually did it. They actually tried to implement them on a society-wide basis. And just from that, the strengths, the weaknesses, the challenges, the, the, the victories that they experienced, as far as I'm concerned, is the next chapter in the history of assembly democracy, of the tradition of assembly democracy. They're the ones who are writing it and their difficulties and challenges will be the ones that anyone else who tries to form such a society has to grapple with and their solutions will be useful to the rest of us. And so they must be studied and they, people will, people, they, they, they are, they are um, path breaking, they're path breakers, trailblazers towards the implementation of these ideas on a wide scale. Um, second, I just wanted to say something about the term democratic autonomy. This is, I was a little puzzled by this phrase for a long time because it's, uh, couldn't really understand why that existed along with democratic confederalism, but sorry for being a little slow. Um, it was only in the past year or so that I realized, well, of course, it's not just autonomy from the state that they meant by that, but autonomy from colonial powers. I mean, this, the, 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 uh, John was theorizing from the Middle East. They needed a concept of autonomy, which Murray, living in the United States, didn't have to grapple with. But Erdogan writing the Middle East did. So it's, I think that phrase democratic autonomy also contains the meaning of autonomy and rejection of a colonial, colonial experience and, and society standing on their own. So I, I, I just wanted to say that. The third thing that, and, and they, the, it's a much broader topic, um, but I'll just touch on it a little bit here is that Murray, as we know, wrote about opposition to hierarchies of all kinds. And he was genuine, a genuinely egalitarian man. He was opposed to hierarchies, not only of states, not only of economic domination, corporation, but also social hierarchies like racism and patriarchy. But that phrase, interestingly enough, it's very important, but it also, and he could, he could speak about it as kind of a shorthand. And what, one thing that had to happen in northeastern Syria, which as Rojava is now called, was to unpack that. What did it really mean to oppose hierarchy? What did it mean to open up society, for example, to half of its previously repressed population, women? How did that change? You see, suddenly say, op well, open the doors for women to participate in all roles in society. What does that do? It was a brilliant move. I think a brilliant improvement on Murray's ideas on Ungerland's part, because it is in itself democratizing to open up the society to, to, to half, of its, half of its members who didn't have access before, didn't have full, citizen, full citizenship before. So that, that is part of that unpacking of opposition to hierarchy. The second one, the second phrase that I wanna talk about is that Murray expected that a citizen democracy would be based on our common humanity. He was deeply, a, he deeply hated tribalism. He, um, he, he had experienced anti-Semitism as a Jew. He loathed tribalism and prejudice. And he spoke as the, uh, an alternative, as uh, recognition of our common humanity as the common baseline, as our common 
as the as the principle that to 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 pit against tribalism. But what did that mean in in northeast Syria in Rojava, where there are a lot of different peoples there? And I was really surprised to find out it's it's not just Arabs and Kurds. There's Assyrians. There's a just it's very ethnically and religiously heterogeneous that part of the world. Um, and yes, it's fine to say common humanity, but how how does one move forward in that in on the ground? And I the way I think about this is that it meant creating basically what might seem an oxymoronic concept, a multi-ethnic democracy. That is one that regards all groups of people or all components, as the Kurdish movement calls them, all components, ethnic, religious, gender, as equals and, and treating them with respect. Now, when I first when I first visited Rojava in two, December of 2014, about two and a half years after the revolution, the commitment to a multi-ethnic democracy was there, but it was in some, and it was in, it was still evolving. It was in some places, it seemed to me to be a little uneasy because, you know, there's a, a lar large Arab populations in those, in those original three cantons, well, three cantons, especially in Jazeera. Um, the commitment was there to, but for example, when our delegation would go around to different uh, um, academies like the Asayish Academy or the uh, YPG or YPJ Academy, and they would give us a little presentation on what they were doing, they kept using this phrase, no revenge taking. So what that meant was, you know, the Assad dictatorship had, had told the Arabs that if the Kurds ever came to power, they would persecute you just as we persecute them. So that can't ever happen. And there's a um, kind of a history of, you know, circle, cycles of revenge, cycles of, of retribution um, in the Middle East and in elsewhere. It's not, not, not endemic to the Middle East, that's for sure. Um, but this principle that I heard at these academies of no payback. So now that the Kurds and some Arabs and Assyrians and their other allies in Kamishlo and in Jazeera and Kobani were had 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 formed this new polity and were setting the terms of it. It would have been expected by the history of the region to think, okay, now we're in trouble. Now the rest of us are in trouble. But the Kurds kept, but the these academies, they kept saying no payback, no payback, as if it were, but which is great, but it meant that it was also a live possibility that they were still in that process of educating against revenge taking. And maybe once one or two times there was somebody who would go rogue. And but that wasn't the that wasn't the principle. So that was in 2014. When I was there in April of 2019, it was no longer an issue. Nobody had to say no payback anymore. And in fact, I was there, see, I was there to make a film and I was going around interviewing people with a microphone and camera. And when I asked people about tribal animosities, I asked, I went to an Arab village. I asked them about, you know, what it was like to be, you know, under rule with a lot of Kurds. And they just waved me off. No difference, no difference. Every, I, I swear to you, every time I asked about this, the issue of, ethnic difficulty, they would just laugh and wave me off. Almost seemed irritated by the question, like they'd been asked it too many times and it just wasn't an issue. Well, what had happened between 2014 and 2019? The war against Islamic State, right? Is, uh, IS came up in, in uh, the summer of 2014. The battle for Kobani was 2014 to 2015. And during, and, and, it, and the war against Islamic State had just ended, at least on Syrian territory, in um, a month before I was there, in March 2019. So they were just <laughs> taking a deep, taking a breath after that protracted battle. And one thing that became very clear was that the people of different components, in, whether ethnicity, religion, gender. They had come to respect each other's fighting ability in that war. They learned in that war to, that they had depended on each other, 
and that they and they learned that if they were to have a future free of autocracy, their future, their common future, lay together. Okay, so um, I was just I was very touched when I visited. They, they are in all the different cities of the Northeast. There's dedicated cemeteries dedicated to to martyrs in the war, and they're not cordoned off into here's the Arab section, here's the Kurdish section, here's the Assyrian section, here's the women. No, they're they're all buried together. I find that I find that just very very reflective, very moving, and the gravestones, they're all uniform. So even if someone was a commander, the gravestone is the same as rank and file. So there's a, a just a marvelous sense of egalitarianism and a, a YPG commander that I influenced, that I interviewed there said, we're all links of a chain. We're all links in a chain. So the one, the one thing that was missing for me was the, ro was the role of Arab women. Um, that was the, seemed like it was the thing that needed the most work because Many of the women, not all certainly, but many Arab women uh, of the region mistrusted the new roles for women, um, believing that Islam somehow disapproved of them going out into society and having access to everything that men had. Um, and I, I, I was, I went to a, actually went to a commune meeting, like a town meeting, in an Arab village uh, near the Euphrates River. Um, they were packed into a little schoolroom, and it was except for except for one person. They were all men, and they were they were the, it, the meeting was going through the same processes that meetings of Kurds and in, you know that I'd seen in other parts of other parts of the Northeast. Uh, but there was only one woman, and and that bothered me. I saw that that was still a difficulty. And then a couple of days later, I was I went to we went to Ainaisa which was the seat of the, the um, self-administration. And I saw my old friend, Amina Asa, who I'd met back in 2014. Back then she'd said, you know, there was this whole mentality with the Arabs of, of domination. We have to get rid of that mentality. And I, so when I saw her five years later, I said, so how is that going? How is that process of unraveling mental structures of domination going? She said, that's almost not a problem anymore. She said, the issue is women. Here's what I've been doing. So what she, as she was kind of by this time kind of a higher up in the in the self administration. I asked her what she'd been doing, and she said that she'd found some schools. You know, because during the, that war against the Islamic State, the the uh, SDF had liberated a lot of Arab villages, a lot of Arab areas had been added on to the original three cantons, um, and um, it was a there was a the question of creating. The communes creating the the self governmental structure, creating democratic confederalism in these Arab areas, and she said in uh, Raqqa and in Tabqa, and I think I think in Deir I can't remember, but I know in Raqqa, Raqqa and Tabqa, what she had done was create um, schools for for Arab women, like they're like twenty days sessions. They put their cell phones aside, they go and they live there with other women for twenty days and learn about history of women and learn about patriarchy, learn about um, how this is all socially created. And they learn about the democratic structure and how they can participate. And it was like what we would call consciousness raising. I mean, they got their, they got their education and this woman there, oh my gosh. So she, there's this lecturer giving a class, giving them a, a lecture on the democratic nation and I guess she had been lecturing before because she asked the students to, what is the democratic nation? And they just kept raising their hands and saying, I'm, I'm, this is the notebook that I kept there. So this is, I'm reading to you from my notes. Democratic nations means equality between everyone. Democratic e e nation is equality of women and men. Democratic equality is respect for people, for different people. Democratic nation is a self-rule. Democratic nation is freedom, freedoms of women. Na Democratic nation is the freedom of people to decide for themselves. And it just went on and on like that. And the day I was there was the, the next day was their graduation from the 20 day section. And so we went back because we wanted to see what happened at the graduation. And 
I interviewed some of the women and said, well, what do you plan to do with this? And some of them said, you know, I'm going to go to my commune meeting, of course. And some said, I'm going to teach my daughters to go to the commune meetings and to, and to that they can be anything that they want to be. And I asked the, the administrator, well, yeah, but look at this. Their husbands are coming to pick them up. They're going back into the patriarchal world. And she said, we've already sorted that out. We have support groups for them organized. And so, so that they can, they can um, you know, turn to each other for a consultation if they need it. So I had very high hopes for them. Now, this was April, 2019. Um, the, and of course, the um, er, um, Erdogan invaded in October of 2019 and turned things, there's a lot of turmoil in the, in the Northeast now. And um, I, I really don't know how things have changed. I only hope that <laughs> the women of Raqqa and Topka continue, or have been able to continue and to huh, fulfill the dreams of a multi-ethnic and a multi-gender democracy. Today, I have to say, I am fascinated by this concept of multi-ethnic democracy because of what's happening in the United States. Um, as you know, it's found to be very difficult as those lusting for power uh, try to gain and hang on to power by inflaming ethnic hatreds. For four years, we've had nothing but messages from the center um, about the, um, um, not only condoning, but encouraging and inflaming ethnic hatreds. During the same four years, as I was paying attention to Rojava, different messages were coming from the center, messages of respect and cooperation and, and mutual appreciation. So one thing, I, there are many things to take away from that, but in order for multi-ethnic democracy to happen, I, messaging counts, messaging really counts. It can, it can work one way or the other. Um, I think, I think Abdullah Erjulan learned many things from Murray Bookchin, from his writings. But today I think the world with autocracies on the rise everywhere can learn a lot from the model of Northeastern Syria. In, an, in, in a world where democracy has been in retreat due to rising tribal hatreds, it's a rare place showing that multi-ethnic democracy is possible, showing the rest of us how to do it, showing us why, and showing that it can happen. Thank you.